Great. Thank you so much, John. Um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Chloe Tomlinson. I'm the program director for Spark Microgrants. And um, I'm calling in today from Kampala, Uganda, with my colleague, Katie Lindquist, the communications director for Spark. Hi, everybody. We're really excited to talk with the community of practice today and really appreciative to John and the Hunker Project for the opportunity. Uh, we connected with John after convening a collaborative of aligned implementers and funders over in East Africa last July and are really grateful to have an aligned community of practice uh, to be working with towards our shared aims. Um, and One Village Partners was, was actually in attendance at that event as well. Um, so really great to have you on the call here. Um, but at Spark, we're really big on listening, of course, and so to start off, we'd really appreciate um, your feedback on what you're hoping to get out of the session, sort of any questions you're coming to with, any things that you're hoping to learn so that we can try our best to uh, make sure to meet those expectations and address those points during the conversation today. So we want to give um, everyone a couple of minutes to write in any questions or expectations that you had, and John, if you think it would be useful for anyone who just jumped in to introduce themselves, we could do that as well, as I think a couple of people just joined joined the call. Yeah, uh, Denise, can, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, John. I'm Denise May. I'm working uh, at uh, FXB USA. I'm the uh, yep. social media intern. Oh, fabulous. Hi, how are you, everybody? Can Great, you hear me? Okay, and did somebody else join? Oh, uh, Karina's there with you, I see. Okay, well, go ahead, uh, Chloe and Katie. Okay, great. Well, like I said, it would be really great to hear any expectations that people have for the call in the chat window. And um, the speech bubble, um, there's a space to, um, to type some in, and we just would really appreciate hearing your thoughts. Um, thanks. We've already got some comments coming in. We're going to give a couple of minutes um, to read through people's expectations before we dive in. Or if there are some people who are calling in from a number, feel free to um, just uh, shout out your expectations on the call as well. Great. Well, thanks to the, um, the people who have added in some expectations already, and please feel free to use the chat um, during the presentation to just jot down any questions as they come up, and we'll, of course, um, leave some time at the end for discussion as well, and looking forward to diving into to those questions. Right. As some background on Spark, uh, we started off in 2010 with the question of how we can enable communities to drive their own change. And over the past six years, we've developed a facilitated collective action process that we have directly deployed in 124 communities across Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi. We've also developed a training program that prepares organizations to implement the full process in their own context and have trained an organization in Eastern Congo that is successfully implementing the process in 10 of their community partners. Before Chloe dives into the details of Spark's process methodology, we thought we would take some time to set the stage with how Spark understands our own positioning within the sector. Over the last decade, there has been an exciting shift within the development sector from prescript prescriptive aid to community-led development. This community practice and the work of the Hunger Project and the community-led development movement is evidence to the growing demand and desire for approaches that are grounded in community engagement. Right now, there is over $5 billion that is spent on community-led development every year. This number continues to climb year after year. For example, in 1996, 
the World Bank only spent $395 million annually on programs they termed community-driven development. Today, they spend up of $3 billion every year on those same programs. Demand for community-led development is growing for many reasons, but three of the most important and exciting reasons are as follows. First, there is a huge drive towards efficiency within the sector. Community-led development programs on average cost one-fourth the cost of the same project driven by top-down efforts and have significantly higher levels of sustainability. The second reason is around local ownership. Because community-led development shifts decision-making power into community hands, ownership and accountability over both project and community success is held and driven at the local level. This not only enables long-term project sustainability, but also sets the stage for sustained collective action. And third, there is a growing body of evidence um, that we're excited to talk with you more about and, and hear your input as well around community-led development and how it leads to long-term change both for community livelihood but also within institutional responsiveness to community needs. Even with these large resources available for this type of approach and the growing body of evidence that the sector is starting to compile, there are still major barriers to scaling community-led development approaches. Some of the biggest barriers to scale that we've seen, experienced, and talked to others about are first having a streamlined facilitation process. Many people we talk to from large-scale implementers to community-based organizations have incredible community capacity building and facilitation approaches, but often these approaches lack coherency across communities and countries, which hinders scale. The second big barrier is around the lack of transparency and accountability systems that have been built into past community-led development programs. As I'm sure all of us can attest, without strong transparency and accountability at a local level, the intended impacts of our programs just don't happen. And often there's many unintended consequences. The third big barrier, and probably the most complex one, is around institutional demand for community-led development. Though large age organizations like the World Bank and USAID have started to make resources available for this type of approach, Many larger implementing organizations, and especially many governments, lack both the incentive and the capacity to undertake large-scale CLD program rollouts. SPARC has built our model and our organization to try and address these barriers in the hopes of offering the sector a scalable and efficient way to roll out community-driven programs at scale and across context. Our solution is threefold. First, our model the facilitated collective action process is streamlined and adaptable across context. And it's built in a way to enable a variety of third-party actors from other organizations to local governments to adopt the model with similar levels of equality. Second, we built streamlined feedback loops within our model that ensure accountability and transparency as well as ongoing program fidelity. For example, we just rolled out a new SMS platform that alerts every community member in our partner villages when a SPARC is going to disperse a grant to that community. This enables community members to hold both SPARC and their community leadership team accountable. Third, we've gathered exciting proof on local institutional strengthening, proof that we think is the beginning of a compelling case that we can present to governments and larger aid organizations for them to adopt community-led approaches in the future. We've seen that local governments we've worked with in Rwanda and Uganda not only respond positively to our work, but have actually began actively seeking us out for support in their own programming. One district government that we work with in Rwanda has even asked Spark to start training their own community development workers because they've seen such success on the ground. Now, with this stage set, and thanks so much for letting me run through that with you guys. I'm going to hand it over to Chloe, who's going to do a deep dive into the first part of our solution, the facilitated collective action process. Thanks, Katie. Um, as an overview, Spark's facilitated collective action process begins with an intensive six-month period in which the community meets weekly, setting communal goals, deciding on a project, and ultimately developing a thorough project proposal. Spark then provides a small grant paired with community contributions to implement the project. Finally, Spark provides two years of follow-up support um, before transitioning out of the community partnership. 
All in all, our engagement with communities typically lasts three years. Um, in the spirit of sharing approaches and learnings to add to the community of practice, I'd like to delve um, into a bit more detail on um, some different aspects of the process. First of all, SPARK facilitators are the link between SPARK and our community partners and critical to the process. They're recruited through our fellowship program, which enrolls local university graduates who are passionate about community-led development and fluent in the language and culture of the regions that we work in. The SPARK process begins when facilitators reach out proactively to rural villages through local government to identify communities that have low organization, lack cohesion, and have poor leadership. Once we partner with a new community, the facilitator guides them through process of electing leadership, developing a vision statement, and conducting an analysis of community assets. Although there is a SPARK facilitator, present at these community meetings. The goal is to get the community members taking the lead even from this early in the process. The facilitator will ask community members to set their own agenda, placing them in the driving seat of the meeting. And when invited, the facilitator will introduce activities for the day, including resource mapping or consensus building tools, or later on, budgeting and risk assessment activities. Throughout the meeting, the facilitator will constantly encourage community members to facilitate activities and discussions themselves. Generally, meetings last about two hours and are attended by between 50 and 100 community members, depending on the region. Once the community has established this strong foundation for the process, the village is able to start working on brainstorming communal goals, deciding which goal they really want to work on together through this process, outlining more measurable objectives for what it will, for what steps it will take to reach this goal, and finally brainstorming, deliberating, and choosing a project that will be most impactful for them towards this goal. To ensure thorough planning of the project, the facilitator brings in tools for the community to build a monitoring and evaluation system to understand if their project is successful, um, to develop action plans and budgets, both for the initial implementation as well as the operations of the project, and to thoroughly analyze and plan for mitigating project risks. Both the SPARK team and an external technical advisor recruited by SPARK review the community's proposal and provide feedback to them on how to revise their project plans. The role of outsiders, though, is still facilitative, to push the community with questions and to share relevant tools and information for the community to make their own decisions and plans for their project. Finally, when the proposal is approved by the SPARK team, the community mobilizes their own contributions and SPARK provides a small grant between two to 10,000 US dollars for the project to be implemented. The facilitator continues meeting the community twice a month to serve as an accountability partner and to provide project management support and trainings during these early stages of the community operating their own project. Finally, once the project is fully operational, the SPARK facilitator continues to visit the community for two years, starting off with monthly visits, but decreasing support to quarterly visits by the end of the second year. During this period, representatives chosen by the community are trained in facilitating the SPARK process themselves, and the full community reviews the goals and objectives that they set um, many months and months ago, early in the process, and they start to plan for additional initiatives that they can work on that will help them reach their vision for their community. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chloe, for taking us through that. Now, in order to understand the impact of SPARK's facilitated collective action process, we measure community success against five impact pillars. The first pillar, civic engagement, is measured through community participation rates demonstrated commitment towards working together and local ownership of project and community success. We see this most evidenced in the 77% of SPARK communities who go on to launch independent projects after their engagement with SPARK. These communities are completely independently designed and funded by the community. The second pillar, 
community capacity. It is measured through growth in both the community's technical capacity as well as their social skills. For example, when a community is able to successfully advocate for themselves to their local government, they have to have both the technical ability to represent themselves professionally as well as a strong sense of confidence in their ability to make change. The third pillar, local leadership, is through quality, diversity, extent, and accountability that is illustrated by both formal and informal leaders within the community. Since SPARC's founding, over 800 community leaders have been elected for SPARC project leadership committees. Perhaps more exciting, though, are the 47 SPARC leaders who decided to run for local government office this past year in Uganda because of the leadership skills they have gained through the SPARC process. And as a side note, over 75% of those who ran for office won their, won their contested seats, which tells us that communities are able to actively strengthen their own governance systems from the bottom up. The fourth pillar is community cohesion, which we measure through a community's sense of belonging, their ability to identify and solve conflicts, and the amount of social capital that they are able to build through the SPARC process. We see this most evidenced by the over 90% of communities who continue to meet on a regular basis after their engagement with SPARC. The last pillar is on sustainable projects, which we measure through both project sustainability rates and also the ability of communities to make self-identified targets through their project. To date, of SPARC's seed-funded projects, 94% are still sustaining. Natsitsape community is an excellent example of this impact. Natsitsape is a small village in eastern Uganda, and though close to town and distance, they were isolated from many services due to a river that cut between their community and the town center. The community was concerned about safe access to school for their children, as there had been instances of students drowning while trying to pass through the river to reach school, and enrollment was dropping. The community decided to solve this problem by constructing a bridge, and they used their $3,000 microgrant, their own contributions, and technical support from the local government to realize this project. And the momentum from this project inspired the community to continue meeting and working together. Not only were they able to improve education outcomes through access to school, but they decided to also start multiple small businesses and improve their local economy through taking advantage of the increased access to markets. This was possible through the sustained collective action that's highlighted in the chart that should be coming up now. Um, this is a chart mapping out um, Spark facilitated compared to independent community meetings happening in Natsitsape from 2013 through 2015 during the time of their partnership with Spark. Um, on the bottom row, you can see Spark facilitated meetings represented. These are meetings where the Spark facilitator was present. And of course, in 2013, you can see that these meetings were happening frequently during the period where the Spark facilitator was supporting the community in setting goals and designing their project. But these meetings become less frequent um, in 2014 as the community was implementing their project and even less frequent in 2015 as the community was managing their project independently and Spark started to pull away from support. But in the above rows you can see the occurrences of Natsitsape facilitated meetings independent of when a Spark facilitator was present. On the second from the bottom row, you can see independent meetings that were happening initially during the planning process. These are meetings the community was having on their own to support the project planning process, writing parts of their proposal, their budget, and action plans together after being given homework by their facilitator. They continued at the same frequency of independent meetings as they were starting to implement their project on the next row up in 2014. And what's most exciting and incredible is that at the very top row, after the community had completed implementing their project, they continued to meet at the same frequency as before, even as Spark was pulling away and ultimately exiting this community. This sustained space for community discussion, deliberation, and planning towards their vision is what Spark aims to create and is seeing in 91% of communities that have gone through the Spark process. 
Thank you so much for giving us this time to share more about Spark's model and methodology. We'd like to now open up the floor for any questions or discussion topics you have for us. And feel free also to type in um, to the GoToMeeting message board. Um, we're happy to respond to those that people want to voice over the call or otherwise. Uh, yeah, this, thank uh, yeah, you. This, thank you for this great presentation. This great presentation. Really terrific. Uh, maybe you can mute while I, uh, maybe you can because I hear it echoing back. Okay. I hear it echoing back. Thanks. Um, so, um, so, oh, it's still echoing. Sorry. Uh, I've got a, a wonderful set of questions here, but I just want to ask one. One of the part of the first phase during that first six months, I presume, must address um, the prevailing mindset. I mean, often rural villages, um, you know, have been deeply disappointed. They're often resigned. They're often, um, as you mentioned, lack of cohesion. Um, can you talk a little about how your approach addresses the, um, the mindset of the community? Are there certain themes that you see that awaken the, uh, that sense of cohesion and a can-do attitude? Sure, great question. And I really think that um, examples from northern Uganda are most poignant in this um, for this question um, in a space especially where we see a lot of dis uh, disappointment and lack of trust um, in external organizations doing development work. Um, and frequently in northern Uganda as we've approached uh, or as facilitators have approached potential new community partners, there's a pretty high level of distrust both towards Spark as an organization as well as internally towards one another. And these are the types of communities that we're intentionally looking for. Um, I think one of the, the main factors that enables the building of trust both between Spark and the community as well as within the community um, is really just the function of the um, continued meetings. Um, it's, there's a, it's really essential from early on in the process that um, the community knows and can rely on the facilitator coming weekly and they be, get into a, this sort of pattern of, of, of coming together where they realize that they can trust the facilitator to continue coming back um, and where they start to have a space to get to know one another and to air out concerns. Um, and sort of issues and be able to talk about them as a full community, whereas there may have not been that space before. Um, and so what we hear a lot is that kind of the, the persistence and the ability to trust the facilitator is something that, that builds up um, that, the, that cohesion that may have been broken down um, in the past by other organizations or by conflicts that um, exist in the community. And that's a part of the reason that we do um, really value the, the six month length of the process to make sure that there is a space um, to, to build that trust throughout. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. That's great. Um, another question is how, oh, and we're starting to get some more questions. This is great. Um, how long, over what period of time and in how has this evolved as over the last six years as you've sort of learned how to do this? Has it did it start out with this pattern? Just say a little bit how, you, how you've learned along the way. Sure, absolutely. Um, the, um, what we call, uh, <laughs> we kind of comically, the FCAP, um, which is the acronym for the Facilitated Collective Action Process, has really evolved immensely over the course of the past six years. And in a lot of ways, we um, just like we think of our working communities as as um, sort of grassroots or bottom up, the development of our process has been the same way. And it's really the facilitators um, who have been the ones innovating and making the big changes in the process over the years. So all of these changes have really been, um, or all of the sort of development and evolution of the process has been, um, has been driven by um, the people who know the process best because they're the ones implementing in the field. Um, so there have been a lot of changes. From early on, even we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what makes the ideal facilitator. We tested out um, local government representatives, um, CBO leaders, um, people from the communities themselves. 
um, and also third-party facilitators um, who were local university graduates. And we really saw a lot of strength in that third-party facilitation where someone has the understanding of the context but can still be a bit of um, sort of a little bit removed from the internal power dynamics and for able to help support um, and push conversations in ways that maybe someone from inside the community or someone who has other interests, for example, local government or in the CBO might not be able to. Um, we also have experimented quite a bit with the length of the process. Um, initially, it was um, just a few meetings. Um, it stabilized at about three months long around 2012 and then ultimately expanded quite a bit um, in sort of 2013 to 2014 to the full six months, both for reasons that I mentioned around that the length of time that it really takes to build that cohesion and trust, um, but also around the you know, the practicalities of project planning um, and how much needs to be discussed as a community before they're prepared to implement the project. These communities are developing about 20 pages worth of proposals um, and it's a lot of work. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Um, another really big change that we saw in, in the process that was driven by the, the facilitators was a shift from sort of an early conception of the process um, as uh, sort of identifying and analyzing problems and finding solutions to a framework where we talk with communities first about their goals um, and then come sort of chart out pathways towards reaching their goals. And this shift from a problem to a goal or vision framework has made quite a bit of difference in our working communities. Um, we saw it as important and I think the facilitator who originally tested it, built it out and tested it out was inspired by kind of being tired with asking communities about their problems. Um, I think they were um, Commun rural communities were almost concerningly willing and prepared to talk about all of what their issues were, but were having challenges visioning or articulating what they wanted to see or what their vision for their community was. So it was really exciting to have the opportunity to talk with communities and to value what's there and what their vision is rather than talking with them about their deficits. We've also found that to be really beneficial in that, um, as I mentioned at the end, one of Spark's main goals or what we really want to see in communities is that sustained collective action. And when you have a problem, even if you're successful and you solve it with a solution, then that kind of feels like a closed book, the end of the story. But we're, what we're trying to do is work with communities and inspire that continued collective action. And when you have a goal that's bigger than one project, bigger than one proposal or six months of meetings, it means that communities have a strong reason to continue meeting and continue working together um, to, to realize that goal. So I see you have three uh, questions in your chat box that you could address. Chloe, can can you uh, do you see the chat box and can you address those? Yes, I do. We were just looking um, at some of the questions, um, and looking at one of them was around key lessons um, in supporting projects or making projects self-sustaining. Um, I mean, or Katie, did you want to? Speak? No. Um, I, I think that. The process, I mean, the process has really been designed around um, around this goal of building uh, building community ownership over projects, and that's done, you know, through the fact that communities um, literally are the ones making all of the decisions and doing all of the plans themselves. So I think when one has made a decision, you kind of own that and the repercussions of it. And so when we see that communities um, are taking ownership for the project plans, that also involves, unfortunately. Um, you know, taking responsibility for challenges that come up in the project um, or even failure of the project. So for one example, a community in Burundi, uh, Nyabagina, um, in their project plans they were budget or they were planning for a uh, motorcycle taxi uh, communal business and unfortunately they had gotten some misinformation and under budgeted sufficiently for uh, or substantially for some of the, the motorbikes. So they're facing a challenge where they had their plans ready, they were ready to go purchase, but found that the motorbikes were much more expensive.
Oh, as as uh, you can see, something has happened to the audio from uh, Uganda. Oh, you're back. Oh, sorry about that. Maybe our connection is a little bit off. Yeah, but it was. John, uh, I'm sorry. Where did I lose you guys? Uh, just about a sentence ago. Okay. Um, so in the community Navagina, as they were um, going to purchase their motorcycles um, and found that the um, found that the prices were much higher than expected, um, instead of going to Spark um, and asking for an increased budget after already signing their grant agreement, they talked amongst themselves and came up with a way to um, to use um, to use. To, to use the budget to purchase the f first two motorcycles, generate the money that they needed with the first two motorcycles to cover the gap in budget for the second two motorcycles. So what this shows us is that that community, realizing that they had done the budgets themselves and made the plans themselves, felt both the responsibility to deal with challenges in the project um, and also had the capacity to problem solve together and to chart a way forward. But ultimately, um, it's really not the necessarily the project impact or sustainability that we're um, you know, most, most excited about or interested in. And there are even, I think what's, what's most important to us is even in ca a case where a community project has failed, um, and I can think of, of a couple of instances where especially um, community projects have failed due to external circumstances. One coming to mind is a beekeeping project where a neighboring community um, ended up uh, deciding to use a pesticide that killed all of the bees unexpectedly. Um, what was most important in that community was that they were able to continue meeting and organizing and through a collective savings start up another project where they could buy sheep collectively and give them to different members of the community um, to improve household level livelihoods. So I think it really comes around um, both um, the ownership that community the communities have over their project plans and the capacity that's built through that planning process for communities to be resilient and to deal with challenges and problems as they come up. One challenge we have seen, um, especially with some of our communities in, in Uganda, our communities, especially in the early stages of when we were still iterating upon the SPARC process, were choosing really ambitious projects. Um, and these are communities that are very rural, that often have never worked together before or partnered with another NGO or received local government services. Um, and they were choosing these incredibly exciting but very, very complex projects um, that were very hard to implement and uh, were a huge investment, an ongoing investment on their part. So one thing we have played around with and built into the process in, in the past two years um, is a, a sort of a feasibility component of the process that helps communities think through what is the long-term investment that we will need to have in this project in order for it to be sustainable. So we take communities through a series of activities where they're able to really dive into those questions and reflect on them and ultimately they will always be making the decisions and we will support whatever they decide but we help facilitate them in a way so they have all of the information and are able to look at their options, their goals and make the best decision for for themselves. Cool. And then you saw Ada Shola's question. He, he, there. Yeah, we'd love to hear a little bit. Ada Shola, can you speak up and say, introduce yourself? If you could unmute your mic. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, Ada Shola. Hello. Good afternoon. Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, good. I am Adeshola Farugun from African Foundation for Development in Nigeria. Uh, we are working on uh, a project we call Empowering Citizens to Engage in Governance. And uh, it's a community project where we have uh, over 40 trade associations, artisan groups uh, that are working with. So my question is, uh, can Spark work with us on this type of project? Thank you. Great question. Spark? No, my question is, can Spark yep. work with us on this kind of project? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Adeshola. I appreciate your question. Sorry, it took, takes us a second to get off of mute over here. Um, but that sounds like a really incredible project and certainly quite aligned. Um, 
one of the ways that we're working with partners currently that we mentioned a bit during the presentation is through um, training partnerships. Um, we've developed a, a training program and support structure where we can work with organizations that are interested in using um, the facilitated collective action process um, in the context that they're working in um, to provide training for for um, their team and their facilitators to, to use the process in their communities. Um, if that sounds like it's of interest to you, um, we'd be really excited to talk with you more, learn more about the work that um, that you guys are doing in Nigeria and brainstorm on 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 how that might how that might apply um, in your work. So thank you for bringing that up. And let's definitely stay in touch. Okay, uh, yeah, I, how can we stay in touch with you so that we can probably, I would love to share with you what we have done before now on that project and to see if there's any way we can move forward with you on it. So I will, I will be glad to share with you in case you can give me, in case I have the link to, to do that. Sure, Thank yeah, you. I'm actually, I'm projecting right now. <laughs> Sorry, I think there's a delay from my computer a bit, so um, please bear with us. Yeah, projecting now, um, both um, Katie and my email addresses and please feel free um, to reach out to either of us either about partnership and collaboration or about other questions about the model. We're also really interested in learning um, in more detail about um, other models and um, sharing sort of best practices as well. So please feel free to reach out to either of us. Great, Chloe. So, um... Jill has the has posted the question: What's the process for measuring your sustainability indicator, and what's the frequency to follow up, and how do you manage this as you grow? Sure. Um, so as we are, um, as we're doing the two years of follow up with communities um, after they've implemented their project, facilitators are able to regularly touch base with the community and check in on the project specifically. Um, to assess if it's still sustaining. Obviously, sustainability looks different based on what the project is, and communities that we're, work, we're partnering with are implementing projects across all sectors. Um, so throughout that two years of follow-up, we can really closely monitor if projects um, are still sustaining. But what we've also been able to do is um, conduct um, small internal evaluations um, to go back to um, older communities, um, that we have that have graduated from the Spark process um, to collect indicators on, on project sustainability as well as on collective action and on other um, indicators of interest, and have been doing that periodically um, for our own learning and to share with some of our partners. We are looking to do an um, an external evaluation in the next few years, um, which will help us to learn even more um, about that question um, in some of our in, in our partner communities. Great. And Finn has posted the question, uh, you mentioned uh, resistance from institutions and governments, and can you share any lessons you have learned in bringing these on board and how to encourage donor governments to adopt this approach? Absolutely. Um, I can dive into that a bit. I think there's multiple levels of government um, and the lessons we've learned on, on those different levels are, are a bit different. Um, we work really, really closely in country in Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi with both district level governments and national governments. Um, one thing that's worked really, really well is to be really proactive about meeting with, with both the district and national level governments. Um, we constantly on a quarterly basis are reporting to them, sharing with them our work, talking to them about how our work best complements what they're doing, how we can best um, work with their own programming. Um, and that's been really successful, that ongoing dialogue and showing that you are committed to the work plan that you've set out and to the communities that you've, that you've uh, decided to partnership with um, has been really, really successful in bringing especially district governments on board with our approach. Um, we've also been able to show them explicitly how the SPARC process uh, better enables them to, to roll out their own programming. So for example, in Rwanda, we've seen um, that communities that are enrolled in our own process show up in government meetings with much higher attendance, with much higher participation rates. And the government has started to notice this, um, has started to dig into why that is, and is interested in learning more about how we can continue to expand in their own districts 
and even train their government workers there. Um, so on the ground and with district and national governments in the countries we're working, it's really about ongoing dialogue, being really proactive about communication, and constantly trying to understand what the government's goals are within the different places that we're working so we can make sure that we are best complementing what they're doing. In terms of donor governments, um, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, a lot of donor governments um, and some of the larger institutions I was mentioning before, the World Bank and USAID, they're really, really interested in these types of approaches and they want to send large amounts of funding to to local institutions, to local community engaged approaches, but they don't quite know how. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a um, and maybe Chloe can weigh in here too, about some of the, the challenges there, but a lot of these governments um, have really strict guidelines around um, the type of impact that they want to see, and they want to fund certain types of approaches, but they're still asking the same questions that they were asking uh, when they were funding more prescriptive types of approaches. So a lot of it is how they're understanding the impact that they want to have and shifting the questions they're asking in order to um, enable grantees to to answer them better and to fit better within their portfolios. Do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Becky. And to um, add on that a bit, um, I think a part of the challenge has been, um, from what we understand, both um, like uh, um, host governments and donor governments have been interested in um, seeing the ratio of funding for facilitation to grant, like direct grants to communities, to be closer to 1090. Um, so only 10% of the funds going towards the, the facilitation of the process. And um, with the model that we're using, it's closer to 50-50. And the reason for that is that a lot of those social impacts around cohesion, um, are, like John was bringing up, around um, capacity and leadership um, and civic engagement, those things come out of the strength of the facilitation process. And so I think that um, it's a part of what we're hoping to do over the next few years and, and potentially with this external eval is to um, sort of flesh out and better um, articulate um, with data the value of that facilitation process to um, both donor governments um, and um, host governments in, in why this approach could, could be valuable and how it can actually create the impact that they're hoping to see. Um, I have an I have another question. Uh, this is John. This has to do with scale. You're working with the traditional communities, which are small, um, 50, 100 household communities. Uh, they're part of a sub-county or an, another larger area. And um, I know um, different NGOs like ours, World Vision, uh, try to find ways to work at larger scales with clusters of villages or with um, or with sub-district units themselves, um, which, you know, certainly takes longer, but allows you to tackle some of the more ambitious projects. Have you looked, uh, what's your own thinking about uh, the appropriate scale of, because if you're interfacing at the district, that's a long way down to the community. So what are your thoughts about um, how communities can tackle these more ambitious projects like establishing a secondary school? Sure. Um, right now, actually, we're, that's a great question and one that we are thinking through quite a bit as a team and, and charting out um, pathways to um, testing out larger scale rollouts and stronger government engagement in the process, like your, um, like as you were mentioning and asking about. Um, so one thing we're hoping to do, or we are going to do over the next five years, is roll out the SPARC process um, across a district in northern Uganda. Um, and so that will involve implement, directly implementing the SPARC process in 150 villages um, covering, the, um, covering the district. And that's going to teach us a lot about um, what sort of the, the staffing and operational needs as well as the programmatic needs would be to do a larger scale rollout of the process and to mimic what it might look like if a larger implementer such as a larger INGO or the government 
um, were to utilize the process um, on that larger scale. And I think as a part of that, some of the learnings will be how to better engage and plug into district um, or other local government planning mechanisms and how to coordinate planning across so many communities that are working on their visions for the future so that we can build on um, sort of the um, the energy or the opportunity for for communities to um, either um, advocate at, at the government level um, and have more voice for larger projects or even to work together on larger scale projects that they couldn't necessarily accomplish alone. And so it will be, it's a really exciting opportunity for us to um, be able to map out and demonstrate more clearly what that would look like and at the same time build out the systems um, that we need in order to um, provide the management and monitoring support on a much larger level um, such that those INGOs or government ultimately could be have the tools and the structure um, and the evidence <laughs> to push them to be able to roll it out um, themselves on that type of scale. Fabulous. Well, congratulations on this very well-organized and clear, very empowering presentation. I really, this has been our first webinar. I want to just see if there are any other questions for anyone. I haven't seen any come up um, because uh, we could close if there aren't. So does anyone have any last questions or comments before we wrap it up? Okay, hello, can I, uh, hello? Yes, hi, Arisho. Am I on? Yes, you okay, are. Okay, so this is Arishola from uh, from Nigeria, Africa Policy for Environment and Development. Yeah, I just want to, uh, you know, like, while, while the presentation was on, I was uh, trying to go through the Spark Micro Grants uh, website, and uh, I could see uh, the work you guys have done, so I want to commend you, and I want to also uh, say that if we have more of these activities going around the world, then the world is going to be a better place for us sooner than we expect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adishal. I really appreciate that and look forward to hopefully continuing the conversations with, with you and your organization as well. And also just want to really appreciate the opportunity from the Hunger Project and from you, John, um, for this great chance to, to give the first webinar and say that we're very excited as well for the follow-up community practice webinars and to learn more about the models that all of you are working with and ways that we can um, share best practices and learn from one another. Great. Well, thank you again. And our next one is coming up right away. It's Tuesday, and it's a very interesting subject. It's tackling transforming the um, emergency humanitarian relief system um, to be more community-centric. Uh, and uh, uh, Donnell uh, Riley from Catholic Relief will present. He's just come back from the Humanitarian Summit, uh, so we'll get to hear about that. Uh, meanwhile, I'll um, edit out some of um, the uh, technical glitches out of the recording of this and put it on our website so that we can share it with everybody. Thank you all for joining. It's uh, great having you all together, and um, I look forward to being with you as we move forward. And Chloe and Katie, thank you so much. Great job. Yay. Thank you, too. We thanks really everybody. appreciate the opportunity, and thanks for all the great questions. Okay, bye everybody. Bye. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>